Welcome back to the Mobile and Park series. This is actually part eight of the Mobile and Park series. Uh, if you kept around this long, thank you so much. Hopefully you found value from these videos of me sharing my experience. So in part eight, I kind of want to share uh, some of the mistakes that I made and what I've learned from it and how it's going to kind of pivot me moving forward in terms of mobile home parks. Um, so the first mistake was, you know, property management, right? So unfortunately, there's not many good third party operators in the mobile home park space. That's why a lot of the large syndicators and the syndicators that you should invest with, they should have their own in-house property management company because there's so many things that can go wrong, right? Like when you have skin in the game, that's when things get done. And what I'm learning on mobile home park space is they need to have skin in the game as well, or else they will not care as much. So, you know, I had an offsite property manager, onsite property manager, you know, they've been in the business for 30 years. Um, you know, they, you know, did the best they can, but they just weren't great at, you know, communicating regularly, you know, reports started becoming late. You know, they weren't great at setting expectations on what to expect with the park all that stuff. So, you know, it's, I don't blame them at all. I actually blame myself for not being them better, but in the mobile home park space, you don't have many options, right? Like, like you just can't like over apartments, you can, you know, get rid of one property manager and quickly find like five more easily to replace it. But in the mobile home park space, it's so niche that you don't have many great ones. So you're just getting stuck with ones that are like, are okay, but could be better. And that's how I kind of felt, right? Like, you know, they manage 70 parks. Just because they manage 70 parks doesn't mean that they're great, right? Or they just do it enough to get by and you took the deal of that, right? So that's, that's a reality. So mistake number one was, you know, obviously there's not many property management options. That's just a, the air to entry for the mobile and park space. Um, my second mistake that I made was, you know, choosing an area where the crime was a little bit too high that I would feel comfortable with. Um, you know, it was definitely in uh, the path of progress is improving, but you know, when there's a lot of high crime, um, you know, I would say like maybe like a D plus area, <clears throat> you're just dealing with a lot more like vandalism. Um, you're going to have to hire security or like pay for sky cop or security cameras and that's additional cost. Um, on top of that, so, you know, it's kind of like one step forward, two steps back, like maybe you finish renovating a unit and then, you know, they, they break in and they'll steal the water heater right? Like as, as an example, or, and now you have to replace the windows and then, then you have to replace the water heater. So, you know, that's the same thing happens in apartment complexes, right? You have an empty apartment complex in a bad area. People are going to break in, you know, you know, people loitering around there, nothing good's happening. So, you know, I basically had to shell out for a security, which ended up solving the issue. But then now, you know, you had the additional expense that you anticipate of having security, right? So that one is fixable with money. Uh, number three is, I think this heavy value add park uh, required a lot more time and effort um, than I would like. You know, obviously it required, I put most of my money into this park as well as most of my time. Even though I'm doing value add for my uh, two apartment complexes as well, those I would consider more passive, relatively speaking. Like I was, even though I have an offsite property manager, onsite property manager, you constantly have to be available. Uh, you have to have weekly calls, you have to hold them accountable. There's a lot of things that I had to do, right? You have to get a dealer's license, you have to sign up for that. You have to, um, you know, get a loan uh, with 21st Mortgage or North Point Commercial. And that's a long application process that only I can do. Uh, there's a lot of things that like your offsite manager, if they're not taking ownership or accountability over things, you're going to step in and, and make sure that you remove those barriers because it's your money on the line uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, it's by, by all means not passive. So I, I get why these mobile park syndicators um, have such large teams because you honestly, for the level of distress and value out of my park, I felt like I need to be on site uh, with a team, right? Like I, I felt like I need to like live at the park and make sure everything's run smoothly because they said no one will care as much as you, right? So um, as a result, and then you want the economies of scale, right? So a mobile home parks, like, can't just own one or two yourself right like if you want to dive into the mobile home park space you better be committed to owning i'd say 20 mobile home parks at least so that's when you start to have the economies of scale right where you can have a team that's like literally on site for your heavy value add parks right and you have more systems and processes you have your own in-house property management you might have your own in-house renovation crew 
So that's what I mean, right? Like for me, I have to depend on third party, right? I have to th- depend on third party uh, offsite property management. And at best, there'll be like a C, right? You're not going to get an A property manager for offsite. And then your onsite manager, you know, you're paying them $2,000 a month. And the quality you can get is not going to be that great either, right? Like they usually live in the park. At best, they're like a handyman. And you know, hopefully they're good at collecting rents. So that's what I mean by, you know, if you just want to own one or two, uh, mobile home parks, to be honest, I recommend just invest in a syndication and invest in a syndication that is vertically integrated. So for me, if, you know, um, you know, if I were to like sell this park uh, down the road, eventually, you know, that's kind of my goal or, or partner with somebody, what I would do is I wouldn't want to partner with a large uh, syndicator. Like just, there's, you can just Google the top five syndicators and see if they want to either A, buy my park or B, uh, give me some equity and then they'll, you know, take over management of the park and then, um, you know, put in more capital for the park because when they're vertically integrated, what's nice is like you said, they have property management in place. They have their own in-house property management, which they have more control over. They have their own in-house uh, renovation team, which they have more control over, but they also have like regional uh, managers that could be deployed to actually be at the mobile park for the really heavy value added ones, right? And they probably have like sales team of that they can move around to sell these mobile home parks. Um, you know, let's just say like for my park, for example, I have, let's say 150 lots that I need to infill with new homes. You know, you need a team just to do that, right? Like there's a lot of work to infill the home. You gotta you know, order the home, takes four weeks to build. They deliver it to you. You have the coordinate of an installer. Installer installs it, assuming there's no delays there. Get to skirt it, add debt, connect utilities, get the power company out there to approve it. That takes about, you know, four weeks for that. So eight weeks total, right? And then when you try to sell homes, you'd have a sales process in place where you help them, you know, fill out the application online through 21st Mortgage, for example, or Vanderbilt. You got to like show the homes, do open houses, all that stuff, right? So it's just a lot of people, a lot of teams. And when you're vertically integrated, uh, you have that team in place, right? And to be vertically integrated, you need at least 30 parks minimum, right? Like for me, I own one park and I don't, you know, third-party management, they don't have that team, right? They don't have a team of like, uh, in. Ha- I mean, they had a um, kind of a renovation crew. That's about it. But they don't, they couldn't deploy one of their offsite managers to my park. Um, you know, obviously they're dependent on screening onsite property managers. They just don't have like a team of like onsite managers that they can deploy to other parks, Um that you know maybe some syndicators would have or like some syndicators they might have their own like install installation company because right now we depend we're, we're dependent on third party as well so when they're vertically integrated they have full control over the whole process and that makes it run more smoothly right there's still gonna be hiccups here and there but it helps it run more smoothly so um for me like now my real estate aspect for mobile and parks is i'm basically gonna buy a distressed park show the value add plan Right. Like I want to buy the park, right. Buy it well with great seller financing, hopefully show the value add strategy, right. Whether that's renovating those homes, uh, selling new homes, like sell one or two new homes or rent out one or two new home, and then pitch that to a larger syndicator that either a, they buy it out for me outright or B they keep me in the deal of small equity with equity in the deal and they manage everything else. Right. That's all I could do as a single operator working full time. Right. So that's why I would say like, if, if, if you just want to own one or two for yourself, I don't think it's worth it. I think it's better just to invest in a large top five syndicator. You know, there's a lot out there. Just Google it. Um, you know, because they own like, you know, hundreds of parks. They have everything's vertically integrated. It's very easy. So you're just a limited partner. You put in your money. You're diversified with mobile home parks. You get all the tax benefits and you don't have to deal with the management. And why I say top five is they have a track record and they're the best at what they do. And even the best at what they do is still inefficient. Right. Like, you know, when I talked to some, I think one of the top five operators, uh, I think it was the Bovita group. And, you know, I was like uh, trying to pitch my deal to them and, and they just seemed so unorganized. I was surprised. I'm like, oh, you're top five. Like, shouldn't you be more organized than this? Right. So even the top five, they're not as organized as they seem, but they're still the best at what they do. Um, so if you just want one or two, you want diversification to mobile and parks, just invest with a top five syndicator. Other than that, if you do want to do like value add mobile parks like what I did, um, just have the expectation that you need to buy it right, uh, show the value add plan, and then sell it to a larger operator, and then you make money by like fixing and flipping it, or you can retain equity in the deal and then let them 
bring the park to the final phase, right? So let's say there's like four phases in the park. Maybe you just do like phase one to show the model and then you pitch it to the syndicator who can finish phase two, three, and four, right? So I could do that moving forward in a scalable way where I just could do the value add, uh, do one phase of the value add and then show the proven model and then pitch it to a larger operator and either get bought out or they they retain some, I retain some equity in the deal. So that, that's, that's what I would do. Um, an, another lesson I would learn is there's a lot of turnover with, you know, the onsite property manager. You know, fortunately for me, I had the same one stay there uh, throughout, but it's just very common that they leave because like I said, they only paid like, you know, $24,000 a year. You can go anywhere you want. So if let's just say they want to move somewhere else, you know, they can, and then you have to have the vetting process of picking your new um, onsite property manager. So that's another um, issue there as well. Um, another thing that I learned was, um, you know, even like renting out to tenants, like a lot of these tenants in the Southeast, they, they want like month to month leases. Like they, they do not commit to like one year leases, um, because they just want that flexibility going in and out. That's just the, the demographic that you're dealing with. So, you know, in apartments, I do one year leases, right. But for the mobile home park, like it's very rare to get a one year lease. So you're kind of stuck with like, well, you know, if the park is being value added, doesn't look the best right now. It's not the, the prettiest girl in the room is what I call it. Um, but so you have to be willing to be flexible at work with these month to month tenants at first, but then once the park is, you know, fixed up, it's nice. You can obviously then get the higher quality tenant. So when you're first starting off, the tenant quality is not that great. And you have to be more flexible at month to month leases, but as the park progresses through the phases, um, you can attract the better renters or home buyers, right? So I was in phase one. So obviously I wasn't, you're not going to attract the best tenants. Um, and then another thing that I learned was just mobile parks is a lot more complex compared to like apartment complexes. You know, there's a lot more moving pieces um, with infilling and more moving pieces, more points of failure, more delay, more money. Right. So in the next video, I'll talk about the difference between mobile parks versus apartment complexes uh, to give you that contrast. Um, and then another one is the infrastructure is very expensive. Right. Like replacing roads. I didn't have to do that. Fortunately, the roads were great. But like replacing new paved roads could be like three hundred thousand dollars. You need to replace, um, you know, septic systems, lagoons. Um, you know, I was looking at one park in Oklahoma where it had a lagoon and it costed $300,000 to like do city water, city, city water connections. So it's very expensive uh, with those large CapEx. When you own a lot of land, um, a lot happens. You know, if you're in a tornado area, which Alabama is, you know, you have to maintain those trees, right? Because you don't want large trees falling down to your homes. And then even during the tornado, branches will fall off, they'll hit the roof, and then now the roof gets dented and you have to repair the roof, right? So there's a lot of things that you're dealing with. Um, so, you know, overall, I would say Mobile Park, it's a lot of capital, high barrier to entry. And if you go in, you better be committed to getting at least 20 parks yourself. If not, you're better off just saving the stress, saving the headache, invest with a large top five Mobile Park operator, or doing what I'm doing where I'm buying distressed parks showing the value add plan and then flipping it to larger operators. All right. So those, that's what I would recommend based on my experience. So hopefully you found value from this video. Hope to see you in the next part.